Uh, my name is Felipe Oliveira. I'm engineer at Cloud. Uh, we're long time, long time users of Play. Uh, we're currently using uh, Play 1.2 in production very extensively. And uh, we're in the process of migrating to Play 2.0. So uh, I'm gonna have some insight on the, on the migration process. Uh, we have actually have a minor application in, uh, uh, in production. Uh, I'm very excited to be here talking uh, for you guys. And, um, and that TypeSafe is supporting a product like Plague and, and it's finally out, right, 2.0, so. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Peter Hausel. I uh, work for TypeSafe and uh, today is actually a big day because we just released 2.0, so if you go to the website, uh, you can actually see the shiny new site. Okay, uh, yeah, so I guess that the most important thing uh, to know about the development process is that like um, uh, Play is developed by uh, Zenex City and TypeSafe, so it's kind of like a co-production between the two companies, which I particularly find exciting. Uh, and I, I think before we get started with like just uh, learning about Play or like uh, what's, in, uh, what's in Play 2 or why we decided to uh, create like a new web framework kind of breaking uh, API compatibility with Play 1.0, I figured it's like a really good time just to really survey what's out there in terms of Scala uh, web ecosystem. I think as a Scala developer, I feel like we are really lucky that because uh, I, I really easily can recommend any of these uh, frameworks that, uh, I, well, I hope I didn't miss any, any of the existing frameworks, but uh, all of them are awesome. Just use them, okay, so you can't go wrong. Uh, so, like, yeah, I mean, uh, just an, a few words about these frameworks. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with them. I can give a short intro if that helps, but just my version, I don't know, like, uh, uh, but anyway, so Unfiltered is like basically a simply API on, um, uh, on top of like a, a really thin like web toolkit. And the main idea is that like you can use like really uh, idiomic Scala just to extract URL information and execute certain uh, piece of code. It also comes with like other helpers like WebSockets and stuff like that. It's a really a nice uh, thin uh, library. So if you're into like, uh, I don't know, just creating like web services or like something really thin, maybe Unfilter is for you. Uh, the next one, which is also kind of like a fairly new library is Blue Eyes. Uh, Blue Eyes is uh, built on like Netty and it's like a lightweight highly productive and um, highly asynchronous uh, lightweight framework. It also comes with some Mon MongoDB sugar. So if you're using MongoDB, if you're building like Scala web services, perhaps uh, Blue Eyes is for you. Uh, the next one uh, is Draft Wizard, which is actually like a Java glue framework, uh, but it has like uh, Scala bindings. So that can be appealing if uh, your stack is like a mixture of Java or Scala or you're just not sure whether you wanna go full Scala, uh, and also if you wanna stay really close to, to the meta, I mean the JVM. Um, and, and there's also like a fairly new framework called SprayCan, which is essentially just like a, a tiny HTTP layer on top of Akka, which is like an event-driven uh, middleware, also um, developed by TypeSafe. And the two, I think, probably the oldest uh, web frameworks in Scala, one is Scalatra, which is like Sinatra in, uh, in Scala uh, built on the Servet API, and of course Leaf, which is uh, a stateful web, uh, um, web framework fo uh, focusing on like, I don't know, security and, uh, uh, and JavaScript helpers, and, uh, and I guess, yeah, it's stateful, which I think it's like a really interesting thing about uh, Leaf. Uh, so that being said, um, there are like a few, uh, few of these um, kind of frameworks that I particularly prefer, and mainly because they share some of, that, uh, some of the technologies behind Play. So these three just like really my favorite, but as I said, like you can't go wrong with uh, you know, these things. Um, but what I, what I really uh, like about like these uh, frameworks, and that's why I figured that it's actually good to talk about other frameworks outside of Play, is that I think right now Scala is in a, such a position right now where most of these frameworks kind of exploring uh, like a kind of what to use options, how to, uh, how, how to be like forward thinking when it comes to web, uh, web development in Scala. And I, I kind of feel like we're kind of trying to find out uh, all these kind of uh, what to use uh, options. And uh, so this is this kind of like, uh, I don't know, uh, experimental phase. 
and I feel like we will diverge at one point. But uh, I don't know, a lot of people think that like, it's fragmentation or it's like, bad for the ecosystem. Personally, I think it's awesome. So I love all of these uh, frameworks. But the kind of the technologies that play uh, shares with, uh, with uh, these other frameworks like Akka or WebSocket support or Netty as the, um, the kind of the, the main uh, HTTP uh, kind of provider or like strong Java API and uh, perhaps most importantly that uh, most of these frameworks are stateless. Okay. So I guess um, then the question is that like if uh, we have all these awesome libraries, why we need like awesome library uh, plus one? So uh, when we decided that uh, like we're gonna create like a, a new uh, kind of framework and play 1.0 uh, actually had like Scala support but the Scala Super was like more like just like a, uh, I don't know, kind of like an add-on. And because Play 1.0 was built on uh, many kind of Jamie and tricks just to provide this kind of special play feeling, if you will, uh, the Scala Super was like really, uh, uh, I don't know, like sometimes it, I think it was like leaking uh, like both abstractions and also we ran into many implementation specific issues. So that's uh, one uh, reason. The other reason, I guess, is that uh, we wanted to really uh, move away from this kind of monolithic framework approach, which was really typical, I guess, uh, like, I don't know, around like 2000, from 2004 to probably like 2010, where like you have the MVC framework, your job is to, I don't know, just uh, create your view and your, my controller is here and I'm just gonna babysit a database. So that kind of uh, monolithic design, which was probably, uh, I don't know, probably Rails made this kind of design really uh, popular, uh, was in fact like the, the de facto stand there for a long time until I guess perhaps when uh, Rails merged with uh, Merb and like they also started exploring this kind of modularization and how to create like standard components. Perhaps people are not gonna use databases anymore. Perhaps somebody is not gonna like my templating solution or you wanna swap out this component or that component. And also, like frameworks uh, starting uh, becoming more and more asynchronous, and uh, web kind of like changed uh, many ways from this kind of pull-centric thing to more like a push, uh, push-centric uh, approach. So that that was kind of like the other underlying reason why why we decided to create like the new version of Play. But when when we uh, when we decided that uh, we're gonna go ahead and do this. Uh, we kind of uh, early on kind of uh, set out our goal, which was that we're gonna focus on like user experience, like we, or I mean, in our case, it's more like developer experience. And what I, what I mean by that, like we really try hard to focus on like, I don't know, small issues. So for example, if you develop in an application, the documentation should be there handy. If, uh, if there is something that the framework can do for you, the framework should do for you without you configuring anything, uh, or you do anything extra. So we like really cr uh, spend crazy amount of time, for example, just to uh, provide like a really thin layer on top of SBT, try to hide some, s some complexities of the, the build tool. But also like, I mean, uh, we, uh, we added so many kind of uh, nice uh, uh, features that we hope that uh, developers will enjoy. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Actually, to talk about this, right, one of the things that are really excited about a cloud or play 2.0 is, for example, the SBT support, right? It is very difficult to work across teams, right, when the, when the build system is a Python script, right, which was the case of play 1.0, right, or 1.2, right? Uh, and the, the Java and Scala support, at the end of the day, felt that, like, like Peter was saying, it was a wrapper on top of the Java framework. So in your day-to-day, -day, you felt the, the, the features were available on Scala that were available on Java, right? Uh, and there is differences that, uh, uh, that running the application of day-to-day, -day, for example, the, 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 the API was a little different. The validation didn't work as well, right? So the, the Scala version of Play 1.2 didn't feel as polished as the Java one did. So uh, we're extremely excited that that has been consolidated into one API now, so. Yeah, that's, um, that's something that uh, we will actually uh, hopefully see in action. So 
yeah, so, th so the goals that we kind of like define were like simply tests should be simple, however, where hard tests sh uh, still should be possible. And also, let's try our best just to make, uh, well, ourselves happy, right? Because at the end of the day, we also developers. And um, so I mentioned that like uh, we also, uh, we also were kind of like suffering with the play 1.0's kind of like magic. Uh, by that I mean that like uh, many of the kind of special, special things in play uh, were implemented um, with, for example, bytecode enhancement and uh, many kind of, uh, kind of unusual uh, techniques that caused uh, issues uh, in other areas. For example, play 1.0 was uh, never in like a, a Maven or IV or artifact. It was really hard to extend. It was really hard to drop in into existing projects. So play 1 definitely had uh, these kind of uh, uh, disadvantages uh, in order to provide a so-called kind of play feel. And uh, I guess the easiest way to uh, to realize what happened in Playland was that uh, so well that the, ma the magic source in Play 2.0 is Scala. And the way it works really is that um, when we work on any APIs, we first create like a Scala kind of like internal API, and then we expose that API both for Java and Scala developers. But underneath, uh, everything is uh, really Scala, but that doesn't mean that like if you're a Java developer, you're not gonna have a really nice uh, and uh, kind of like end user uh, Java API. So just the fact that uh, the framework itself is uh, written in Scala, I think shouldn't really discourage uh, Java developers. And, and I also think the, uh, the, the difference is without all the magic, uh, the development uh, speed on, on 2.0 is much, much faster, right? So all the fun that Play 1.2 provided, right? on the Java version was a little mitigated on the Scala version, right? Because the development process wasn't as fast because of all the magic that, happened, that had to happen, uh, which on the Scala version felt very heavy, right? Uh, 2.0 is, uh, uh, is a joy to work with compared to the 1.0 version, right? Yeah, so I guess uh, uh, we will actually um, see uh, what this kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like the fact that like now we have like a standard project really brings to the table in terms of extensibility and, uh, and also just like being like more modular. Yeah, so uh, w one of the kind of like uh, typical uh, kind of play uh, feature is the development console. I'm not sure how many of you play with uh, 1.0 or like uh, how many of you know what I mean by developer console, but uh, I'm trying to describe the experience for, for those of you who never uh, seen like a play uh, application console before. So the idea is that you fire up this console, which is going to run uh, your application uh, server and then you switch to your uh, uh, favorite text editor ID, and you're gonna start making changes to your application and say, I'm gonna uh, uh, modify like a class. And then I switch to the browser, hit refresh, and uh, your change will be picked up. No extra compilation is necessary, even though your Java or Scala class was modified because compilation is triggered by that browser request. If, if there is an error, uh, your browser is gonna show you uh, within the browser which file had that issue and where. I will show you uh, this really shortly. So this feature wa was available in Play 1.0, but essentially you could really enjoy the benefit of uh, type safety and, uh, and kind of this kind of compile check only if you'd uh, work on Java or Scala classes. But in 2.0 we try to really bring this to the next level. So this is the, uh, the uh, kind of like a typical error message uh, when something goes wrong. In this particular case, uh, this is a Scala uh, class. As you can see, there is a typo there. Uh, so what happened was that like I was editing this file, I switched to the browser, hit refresh, I, s I see this page, oops, there is a typo there. I see what's going on, I switch back to my editor, fix the typo, switch back to the browser, hit refresh, and hopefully the error uh, page will disappear. I don't know if, uh, if you guys, uh, I'm sure you guys using the developer console frequently, 
but what is your experience? Uh, we use it frequently, and uh, and the beautiful part of it, like Peter was saying, is that now we get we get those type of errors right on not only the Scala files, but on on routes, right? The routes file is something that we frequently uh, had a problem 1.0, right? Uh, now we have type checking on the templates, on the routes, on the Scala files, and uh, and it's great not having to fire the play command and fire off the JVM on on all the different commands that uh, that we got execute on play, right? We just actually use the the console and using actually uh, actually as a bash console because you can do some yeah, 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 bash yeah. commands, which is really nice, right? Uh, and uh, and because of the magic that doesn't happen on, on Play 2.0, um, we don't have the problems of having to restart every once in a while, right? Play was great on 1.0, now having to restart every single time like the traditional J2E. But on the Scala version, you still had to do sometimes, right? Uh, that problem has totally been mitigated on uh, 2.0. So that's great. We're really happy about that. Excellent. Um, so in like if you check this slide, um, so most uh, MVC frameworks uh, ha have this concept of mapping uh, like incoming requests or URLs to actions. Some, some frameworks like to keep this information next to the action, like uh, I don't know, Sinatra or Scalatra or Unfiltered in, in Scala. Some applications uh, like Django or Rails uh, like to keep this information in a separate file. Uh, in case of play, this file is called uh, uh, routes. But what's interesting about uh, the play version is that uh, this file is actually compiled. So if you make a typo here, then you're gonna get exactly the same screen that we saw uh, in case of uh, uh, kind of like working on uh, traditional, like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, JVM classes. You also get the same error screen if, for example, you say that like this controller method is taking parameters uh, so it's taking arguments, however you uh, just forget to define those arguments in your RAF file, you also are gonna see this error. Uh, and so basically what it helps you to uh, kind of capture potential and run runtime errors. This can be really useful. But what else uh, we, tried, uh, we tried to kind of compile uh, this time around? The next area is the template. Previously, play used like a Groovy-centric uh, templating solution, probably the closest to ERB, if you're familiar with, uh, with the, the kind of standard Rails uh, template. And um, so the new version of uh, the play, play templating engine is using like a compile check uh, kind of templating engine solution. This is available both for Scala and Java developers. So if you're a Java developer and you need like a templating system, you can use this. However, because the framework is not really extens uh, extensible, you, you really easily can plug in your own templating solution. So this is just an option, but we, we believe that it's like a good starting point. But, so we saw that uh, now compi uh, we, we, we compile in classes, but I mean, uh, hopefully that's, not, uh, that's a bit, big, big surprise. We also compiling uh, the RAD file, but I guess that, uh, that's, uh, that's something unique. But as you can see, we also compile templates. Uh, so you can see that like, uh, oops, something happened uh, that uh, that customer uh, attribute just uh, doesn't exist. So we get the compiler error. And um, another thing that was great about the compilation of the routes is uh, uh, now we can use, if you use an option that uh, on your controller method and on the route, the, the parameter is, uh, is optional, obviously, right? Now, if it's not, play is automatically doing some verification for you, right? Uh, when, the, when the parameter wasn't passed, which is great, feels a lot, uh, that API feels a lot more natural in Scala than you should do on play 1.2, which you had to define those annotations, right? Which can, can uh, your code can get messy very quickly, right? So. And, and the next area uh, which I'm uh, particularly excited about is uh, compiling assets. Um, I mean, I guess the other kind of like trend that was happening besides like, uh, I don't know, web frameworks became more modular and uh, like uh, you could take uh, for granted just a few kind of like assumptions about uh, one's um, kind of tech stack uh, was that uh, JavaScript uh, and the front end stuff became uh, 
uh, increasingly um, uh, kind of like more important. In fact, like I guess we get to a point where we can't really talk about like traditional MVC anymore and all these kind of various layers kind of uh, tied together. So we were really keen just to make sure that like uh, the front end, a front end developer or like a back end developer would experience the same thing. So what we did was we hooked up a JavaScript compilation uh, into the build process. So you're not only getting that uh, this kind of in-browser error reporting for your classes, for your uh, RAS file, or for your templates, but you also get this for JavaScript. What's happening behind the curtain is that we call for if you put your JavaScript file into uh, a specific kind of like directory, then Play will pick it up and we'll run it through Google Closure uh, JavaScript compiler. And if there is like a syntax error there, then it will uh, pick it up and we'll provide the, exactly the same uh, screen that um, uh, we saw before. Uh, this thing also works uh, with CoffeeScript and uh, LAS, which is like a CSS um, uh, kind of transformator uh, kind of library. And uh, in those libraries, you would get the same error message. In this particular case, this is just like a, a plain vanilla uh, JavaScript file. Uh, that said, like, I mean, if you don't want to, for example, uh, pre-compile your JavaScript using Closure Compiler, you, you are not forced to do that. So I guess, like, our main uh, idea this time around was that, like, we're going to provide all these uh, we think useful assumptions and useful features, but we tried our best not to force developers into like a specific model. So if you don't want to compile assets, fine, then you can just serve it as uh, normal, just put it like in a different location. However, if you want to take uh, advantage of all these extra features that uh, Play comes with, uh, by any means, just uh, then uh, use, for example, the asset compilation feature. I'm not sure if you guys using uh, this. I mean, the only thing I have to say about this is how cool is that, right? Compiling your JavaScript, that's a great feature, right? I know I hate going after JavaScript errors, so I think that's a great feature. Yeah, we use that. I love it. Love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I also actually really like um, that one. And I'm actually not even sure whether anyone else did that, so I also feel like there is some special think about it. It's not like we keeping score or anything, but anyway, I, uh, I personally really, really like it and use it frequently as a developer. So we use our tools, so not, not just, you know, uh, writing it, but we also use it. <coughs> so the next thing I want to show you is that um, why the framework itself was written in Scala. It has like a really good uh, Java API. Uh, this particular example is using just one of the sample applications uh, that Pay comes with. And uh, I'm just going to show you one example. This is like a controller here. And uh, the same thing in, in Scala. So as you can see, um, uh, we, we um, provide these kind of sample applications both in both languages. So uh, we figured that like, it's a good, um, uh, good thing to do. Because uh, if you're not sure whether you want to use Scala or Java, then you can just go to the Play website, download the whole package, and you can evaluate side by side that here is, an, here is a sample application. It's doing exactly the same thing. One is implemented in Java, one is implemented in Scala. You can see which one you prefer. Or gradually, you can switch from one language to another. Uh, that's, uh, that's also another problem. Here we, uh, we can see uh, this uh, kind of like uh, type safe um, template in action. Uh, the, the really special character that you really have to focus, in, uh, focus on is the at sign that basically tells uh, the play compiler that like uh, a Scala expression is uh, coming after that. But otherwise, uh, you get like um, a really kind of, uh, I guess, uh, nice and light. Um, uh, Definite not logic class uh, templating solution, uh, which supports layouts and template tags, and so all the standard goodies that you would assume from a framework. Uh, one of the things that we have been enjoying a lot is the, the, the new form, right? The new validation and the new form support on Play 2.0, right? Uh, on Play uh, 1.0, you have the annotations, right? Uh, which not only create a lot of boilerplate, but uh, 
the 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 view support wasn't as nice as there was some support on the controller side and if the and if you're using the the play mo model right but if you had anything anything different than that which is very common on the enterprise right uh your forms normally don't map to your to your model one to one right it became uh it became it wasn't as easy on Play 1.0, right? That the new form library and validation on, on 2.0 made that, that setup much nicer. So I uh, highly recommend that as well. We can take a look, uh, I guess, later, if you guys are interested, because I, do, I don't think I, I have the cover in the slides. But yeah, so the next one is just uh, uh, showing you uh, our kind of like integration test runner. What, uh, what this test runner does is essentially firing up like a whole play application in context, which means that like if you have uh, JavaScript, Ajax calls, whatever, uh, that's, that's fine. You can just uh, uh, use this uh, browser that's, um, that's part of the uh, API to kind of check uh, whether there are certain HTML elements on the page. Uh, this whole thing was built on top of like Selenium WebDriver, if you guys know that uh, library. Uh, just that there's an extra uh, kind of DSL on top of it. And uh, in this particular example, we, for example, using the headless browser called like HTML unit, but you could replace that with Chrome or Firefox, in which case if you run this test, the test itself would be running inside a real browser, just in this particular case because it's uh, part of our um, uh, integration test uh, is running. Uh, just like in a headless mode, so you can run it from the command line, and also like in our uh, kind of like uh, CI environment. Um, yeah, so and, and the same API is available uh, both for Scala and uh, Java. Uh, one of the kind of like uh, new ideas we had uh, about like the framework was um, kind of trying to make sure that like. Uh, IO processing is uh, much easier. There are many typical web, uh, web tests that uh, these days we have to do that, um, like, well, I mean, it's, it's definitely not easy. So for example, providing like, I don't know, streaming, uh, whether it's file streaming or just streaming to, uh, to the browser, providing a synchronous uh, kind of uh, processing in general, which includes like web, uh, web sockets or uh, comet or anything that's not like the typical uh, kind of like uh, re uh, request response uh, kind of processing. And uh, the kind of the idea we borrowed was uh, uh, this kind of like Haskell li library called uh, Iterate IO. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that. In Scala, I think right now we have uh, three or four implementations of the same um, library from Scala Z to, I don't know, uh, like play it <laughs> as well. So I guess uh, what's happening in that space is the same as what's happening in the web space where people are trying to find uh, out like which kind of implementation is the best. So of course we kind of felt like, uh, for example, the Scala Z thing was just way too much for our needs. So we tried to just really create like a minimalistic version of that, but time will tell uh, whether uh, our implementation or their implementation or somebody else's implementation will be the de facto standard. I think it's all good uh, for the community. Uh, and so here's an example uh, how you can do like advanced uh, I.O. with, uh, with play um, uh, iterate I.O. So what you see here, uh, I hope that uh, you guys can read the slide, that like, I mean, we use the kind of the standard kind of uh, iterate I.O. Uh, uh, kind of a name. So uh, you have uh, enumerators which uh, essentially uh, pushing uh, data to, uh, to iterate, uh, iterators. Iterators basically usually, iterators basically providing you the, the kind of the, the input, and that's the kind of the consumer end of the, uh, uh, of the uh, I guess like of the whole like IO thing. Enumerators basically responsible for pushing data from, uh, from the source to the iterators. Unfortunately, in certain situations, uh, the input just doesn't match the output, in which case like you need like enumer enumerities. And what you see here is that we're defining uh, various enumerities that we later combine, and then uh, like, uh, I don't know if I can take this uh, guy, but 
uh, then what we're doing, uh, so we create this two comet uh, wearable, which is basically just like two uh, kind of data transformers, enumerities uh, combined into one. And then uh, what, we call, what we do is that we call like this Twitter uh, feed asynchronously, and then we, uh, then we take this uh, kind of uh, data transfer, uh, uh, yeah, combined data transfer, and uh, kind of apply uh, on top of like uh, an iterate. Now, if this sounds uh, like really uh, crazy and advanced, that's what I meant by that. Uh, like, well, I mean, this is like an advanced technique, and by no means uh, I would say that like this is simple. However, like if you try to implement like uh, Comet or WebSocket um, implementation before, these are not simply tests. But uh, what Play provides is that um, you can easily uh, create, for example, Comet services, or you can uh, send data in chunks to the browser, which uh, I, uh, th that's also a kind of a feature that I really uh, like and use frequently. So in this particular example, which is by the way uh, taken from like a sample application also uh, bundled with the framework, that uh, we kind of uh, take like a Twitter stream and then uh, asynchronously pushing uh, the, uh, like Twitter, I think it's a search or somebody's um, uh, uh, somebody stream into the browser. So if you tweet uh, something, then uh, this push-based um, kind of solution, we push that result to the, uh, the web application. So that was uh, Iterity IO. Uh, are you guys using uh, any of these uh, advanced input processing techniques? Yeah, uh, we're using some of them, and the main difference is like we're actually even on the async processing, right? Uh, that was one of the things that I talked about in the beginning was the difference between uh, 1.0, uh, the the Java implementation, and uh, the Scala implementation. Uh, those are those are features that some of these features, not all of them, obviously, like the comment service, uh, were available on the Java version, but not on the Scala version, right? So uh, it, it feels a uh, uh, so we're definitely happy that it's available on the on the common uh, on the common library now. So we're using some of it, but mm -hmm. so the next benefit of uh, the the new design is that um, uh, we we tried our best to make it like modular and also really extensible. Uh, so we kind of got to a point where you can swap out any component of play, like well, I mean, except probably like the 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 build tool, but anything that you want to swap out, you should be able to do do so easily. That includes, for example, the, the routing uh, mechanism, the templates. If you don't want to use like uh, any databases, you don't have to. You can hook up any libraries that um, that you, you you like. So I'm going to show you guys two examples uh, how you can extend play. Uh, one way to extend uh, the the framework is. Uh, via creating plugins. In this particular case, I just copied like um, some information uh, from our kind of plugin repository. But what you get, uh, for example, with our Redis plugin, which is freely available, by the way, uh, that um, so the Redis plugin uh, lets you to use Redis easily, both from uh, Java and uh, Scala. And, but also the, the Redis plugin is implementing a, a place internal cache API, which means that like if you start using our plugin, instead of using the in-memory based uh, cache solution, boom, all of a sudden now uh, you can use like Redis for, uh, as for your like external cache solution with Play. If you want to keep session data there or uh, anything else, you should be able to do that very, very easily. But you also have access to the underlying, uh, the underlying API, because of course Redis is uh, uh, is uh, kind of like richer than just like, uh, I don't know, providing a simple get and set uh, for you. So you have access to all those kind of advanced features, both in Scala and Java. Uh, actually, that's something that we uh, just implemented as well. Uh, just replace the cache solution uh, with our own implementation. We actually did that yesterday, and it was uh, it was very easy. Something that on Play 1.0 was a bit difficult, right? Because you did have to understand the internals of uh, of Play to be able to extend the, the the framework well. 
uh, on Play.0 is much easier like you just saw it. So we actually just went through this process and it was, uh, it was a joy. So, um, so in, in the next example, uh, what you see here is that um, we kind of replace a play wrapping mechanism and instead of using the external file that I just show you, now we kind of uh, throw in unfiltered uh, kind of request uh, matchers and extractors on top of play and you get this really uh, interesting hybrid where you can use unfiltered on top of play, which, uh, which is uh, actually something that we use heavily uh, when just building, for example, like more like standard uh, web services as opposed to like a full web application, a full stack web application. So uh, as you can see, this application uh, has nothing to do with that uh, control error uh, uh, kind of approach that we saw before because it's using like a different kind of API. But the main idea here is that, um, well, you know, if you don't want to use the routing mechanism, we provide hooks uh, where you can hijack the, the kind of like the standard request processing and you can trap in your own routing mechanism. Outside of this, uh, I, I know that like one person already implemented uh, their Rails kind of um, um, yeah, kind of like a routing mechanism really close to Rails. So now I, I, I'm aware of at least two or three extra routing mechanisms that you can plug in into your application. But because these hooks are so, uh, 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 so these, these hooks pr provide you like access to the whole kind of request cycle, it should be easy to plug in any kind of routing mechanism that, uh, that you want to use. I'm not sure if you guys uh, use any of these hooks to, uh, and do, do stuff. We're using for business logic. <laughs> you know, to yeah. get business logic into it, so. That, that, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, this is just one example, but because uh, you, you, can, uh, you can, for example, do stuff when like a request comes in before your application starts, after your application starts, when the request comes in. So uh, you can execute pretty much anything on, on these events. As far as plugins, actually, I think we have uh, already like about like 10 plugins. Uh, some of them written by us, some of them uh, written by the, the community. We really hope that uh, we will reach like a really extensive set of uh, plugins soon. Uh, this is partly actually thanks to the fact that like, because Play itself became really standard, now you can host your plugins in a standard Maven repository using SBT, so you should be able to just uh, uh, define your dependency and use your own plugin. So there is no like special play repository as uh, we had unfortunately with uh, 1.0. So it's all standard, like just publish your library and then you can reference it in your uh, project. If it's a plugin, you have to just uh, play that uh, it's a plugin. So uh, you have to start up um, and the framework needs to start up your plugin. But otherwise, it's just like a library that you can, uh, you can not drop into play. In fact, even play itself can be dropped into like any other uh, framework that um, uh, that you have. So the example I showed you before, the kind of play uh, mixed with unfiltered kind of thing, that was like a standard uh, kind of Maven project. So that wasn't even like a, a kind of like a play layout. It was a really standard uh, Maven kind of layout. Uh, but because you can play, you can use play as like an HTTP library and just rely on these hooks. Uh, now you can use play even outside of its, uh, it, it, I guess, outside of its normal comfort zone, which would be like the kind of like using the console and using all that kind of play goodies. And for the enterprise, the, the great thing is like, uh, for example, at cloud, we have a centralized API that uh, has our business logic, right? Uh, the reads and writes for data store. And are we using the, the, this type of service, right? To, uh, to get, to have different teams writing different business logic, right? That can be augmented into the main API layer, which with SBT is super easy, right? You publish, publish local, which 1.2 was very complicated with that Python, uh, uh, with, uh, with that Python script. So those are, those are one of the main advantages of, uh, uh, for the enterprise that I see around 2.0, right? We're using extensively a cloud, and uh, and it's been working great. We're very happy. Uh, major improvement over 1.0. So. 
Yeah, and uh, I, I think that that was a really good point because, for example, Heroku and other cloud providers uh, were also really happy about this thing because uh, 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 some of these uh, cloud providers are requiring like really specific uh, things. Uh, for example, like uh, you should be able to just uh, I don't define dependencies and things should be in uh, uh, like repositories and stuff like that. So it was really painful before uh, just to uh, provide any support. Uh, for play, for example, on Heroku, uh, but now there is because there is no magic, uh, you can use play as just like a library. So it should, uh, it hopefully it, it, it will have uh, enterprises mm -hmm. with uh, this kind of issues. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, so and there are many many extra f uh, features that uh, I guess I'm not gonna cover uh, unless like I mean uh, I don't know we well, can maybe see the form validation. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Well. One of the other great features, right, is that we can use Kala 2.9, right, which is great, right? Uh, we can upgrade Akka finally because the integration of Akka on uh, 1.0 wasn't the best, right? Uh, and we had to use a much older version of Akka, right? Uh, we had to run the their 1.0. So now, as Akka is uh, end player under the TypeSafe umbrella, right? The integration is much nicer, and uh, and a lot of the problems that we ran into the 1.0 we're not experiencing anymore. So uh, the the Akka integration is a huge plus as well. So yeah, I mean, on that point, like, I mean, what kind of integration are we talking about? Like, right now, it's possible to override both play and Akka configuration from the command line. You can also pass in just like an external configuration file, both for Akka and play. So that should help, again, I guess, like enterprises uh, just to, I don't know, fit in like in their existing infrastructure. But uh, th there are some other things, right? The database session, for example, right? That was available on the play class loader, wasn't available on the Akka class loader, right? right? So if you're running the, the, the old JPA model, right, on 1.0, you had uh, Hibernate session problems, right? Uh, things like that. Obviously, we're not, you know, play.0 doesn't have Hibernate, but uh, uh, small issues like that, right, that are nagging, right? We don't have that anymore in 2.0 because the, the, the integration was done from the start rather than uh, as a community module that got added on on top of the Scala version that was also added on top of the Java version, right? So uh, it, it is a much more polished uh, uh, integration now, so. Uh, yeah, and just a, and a final comment about uh, Akka. And so basically, Akka is used internally by the framework, but we also created like an Akka plugin. So when we're talking about Akka integration, it's not just that Play itself uh, is heavily using Akka for its own internal business, which is mostly just like uh, kind of dispatching uh, messages and uh, helping with this kind of asynchronousness that the, uh, the framework provides. But because of this uh, uh, plugin that, uh, that's available for end users, you also can start your local or remote actors or interact with uh, actors. And uh, we will see uh, a kind of like a small demo shortly where, for example, we are uh, gonna send messages uh, to an actor and then apply those messages uh, to the response asynchronously and to push, it, push that result to the browser asynchronously. All right, so um, I'm gonna show you guys like a few uh, demos. All right, um, so. So let, first let's see this uh, like. Uh, thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start like yeah. I had like a mix uh, yeah. So I'm gonna start with just like launching the console. So I launched the console. Uh, this is like a standard like SBT uh, console. So anything that SBT provides should be available here. If you wanna see what the what are the extra uh, kind of commands that Play uh, provides, you can just uh, run help Play. And I'm gonna just show you before I run actually the dev server some of these. So 
Uh, one of my favorite is that uh, now you can execute like shell commands from within uh, the play console. So this is just like a git, uh, uh, was it? git status executed from within the console. But you also can see your dependencies. So, well, I mean, uh, I'm using a slightly big, uh, bigger font than usual, but essentially this is going to give you an idea what kind of uh, jars uh, used by your application. And if there are overlapping with certain jars, then you're going to see different colors to represent that. So this is just like another nice add-on. So now I'm going to run the server. This is, again, the, the so-called like developer console or developer server. Okay, close this guy. And uh, because I made a typo, I, uh, I'm anticipating uh, like an error here. OK, so this is the error. So I'm going to switch back. This is the error here. So I'm going to fix it. I just saved the file. I'm switching back and hitting the browser. So this is the kind of user experience I, uh, uh, I was um, uh, talking about. Like th this is kind of like, I think, uh, many ways closer to like uh, dealing with like dynamic languages because I don't have the compilation uh, step and now the application is uh, is running and then if I make another change I just save the file come back hit refresh so there is a compilation error anyway so I guess you guys uh, had an idea So let me just start this guy. And yeah, let's just take a quick look what, uh, what this application is doing. Um, this is uh, one of the sample applications, so you guys can uh, also play with it. Just uh, you download the, uh, the, new, um, uh, the new release, and then uh, this should be part of the release, I think, yes. Uh, so again, uh, this thing is um, using uh, uh, the Iterity IO library. So first, we're creating. Um, Enum uh, the enumerator, which is again the, the kind of the source that's responsible to push uh, data to uh, uh, to uh, to an uh, iterator, and then what we do here, so this is, I'm not sure, yeah. uh, so so we create this enumerator, uh, which essentially gonna uh, update the time. So this is the uh, this is the demo application that we're gonna try to build here. So the enumerator is like uh, going to do this uh, kind of uh, in an endless loop. And then what we do uh, is that we take this enumerator and, uh, and uh, apply this uh, on this uh, kind of comet uh, uh, enumerator. And then as the result, we are creating this kind of chunk uh, responses. And essentially, uh, we sending this uh, new date over the wire periodically. This is using Comet, and it's using uh, a kind of Comet technique called <coughs> uh, like a, what's like the iframe. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of basically like using iframes uh, just to kind of write JavaScript uh, periodically to the, the browser. So in this particular case, we just like uh, sending this uh, to, uh, to the parent of the iframe, uh, the, the, the information that's coming from the date format. Again, like, I mean, uh, the, the idea here is not that, like, uh, I mean, uh, you guys are uh, uh, going to understand everything, but I just wanted to give you a, a, an idea, like, what, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of advanced uh, IO uh, uh, technique or what kind of techniques available uh, with play. So this is uh, essentially just demonstrating how to use Comet easily <laughs> with a Play2 application. So you can see, because it's a, it's a, it's a kind of like an open uh, kind of socket, like you can see that um, uh, the request never terminates. So that's why you see this guy. So it's a push application again, not pull. OK, so I'm going to stop the development console. and. Let's see if it has any more. And I'm going to show you guys another application, which is uh, this chat application using Akka actors. But before I do so, I'm going to kill this guy. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm firing up the console again. Oh, OK. Sorry, it's just it's hard to type. But yeah, so uh, what, what you see here is that uh, we're using uh, our characters to, um, to build like a chat application. And uh, what's happening here is that um, we're sending ACA messages over the wire uh, using the same command technique that, uh, than before. And the net result is that uh, we have this kind of challenge uh, responses uh, sent back to the browser asynchronously. And yeah, uh, I'm going to just run this application then. So let's refresh this. So first, we're just rendering the index page, so nothing funky is going on there. So I'm just going to the chat room. And you can uh, already see that like the kind of the socket is open. So I can start sending messages. So I'm just going to send a few. All right. And well, it's not the best. So I'm going to join from here as well. And you can see that, like, well, I mean, I have two browsers, and this thing is um, sending messages. And you also can see some information about the messages on the console. So again, this is just like a, uh, another, uh, kind of like a short demonstration of uh, how you can use some of the advanced features of both ACA and Play uh, kind of like together. Okay, and I guess the next thing, um, I don't know, do you have anything to add? No, no. Okay. Um, the yeah, so let's see, the, uh, let's see those forms. I think that's a good idea, so. Uh, there is a nice sample application called Forms that comes with the distribution. You should definitely check it out, so. which is what he's going to be showing now. Yeah. All right, so let's see the forms. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you want to explain? <laughs> OK, um, so yeah, so what, what you see here is that like uh, this is the Scala API right, uh, uh, for form building. Uh, the form API pr provides you like a kind of like a rich DS7 comes to like they're defining a form, but it also provides you like uh, with validation. So uh, you can define your uh, kind of like uh, form here, uh, define the HTML, and then uh, take take a post uh, and then uh, kind of uh, serialize back into this uh, this guy. And if there is a validation error, then uh, then you can uh, kind of handle the validation error accordingly. So uh, in this particular case, we say that the contact, uh, contact form has uh, just uh, four fields. Uh, the first field is just like basically a mandatory field. Uh, first and last name uh, are uh, mandatory. And then we have the company name, which is optional. And then uh, there is basically an extra map, which contains informa uh, information, which I think should be correctly like this. But Besides the point, uh, and um, and then like yeah, so so these are kind of like uh, the various uh, uh, validation options that um, uh, you can choose. Um, so you have email and phone number and stuff like that. And let me try to find yeah. And um, so th this is how the validation is ha uh, handled. So the submit um, action is uh, uh, registered uh, for the post. So when you send your uh, form, then uh, what we're doing is that uh, here's this kind of like implicit request that we use to kind of build a, a kind of form from. So now it's kind of serialized from, uh, from the post. And then uh, using FOIL, we can decide that there, uh, whether there was an error on the form, in which case we're just sending back like a bad request. Or uh, we can just sh uh, show the summary. And the nice thing is that you can concentrate on the, the actual business logic of your form, right? Define your fields and the, the validation parameters rather than concentrating on the boilerplate 
if valid, return to a certain view, right? Passing the flashback. So, uh, uh, and, and there's a nice integration of the template language as well, right? Uh, so you don't have to define your input type and the, the display errors and all the good stuff that comes with, you know, defining forms. So that's a major improvement over the 1.0 version. So. Yeah, and this is the kind of corresponding form uh, using like some of the built-in template uh, helpers that, um, that, that we provide. So I don't know. And that's actually a custom one, right? You can actually make it smaller than that just using the, 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 the input tag, right? Uh, right? The Scala input tag. Uh, he, he's showing you some customization what comes with play, right? But, uh, uh, but if you just want to use what is, uh, 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 what play is displaying by default, right? That's right. all you really need, right? And uh, and I can tell you that we use the, the default very often. So, all right, I uh, I guess that's it. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, guys. All right. <laughs>